Hello. Um, thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Chairman and Organizing Committee, for the invitation to speak today. I'm going to cover central compartment atopic disease, which is something that may be familiar to some of you, and this may be an introduction of this uh, particular entity to others. So we'll begin with discussion of a couple of cases to illustrate. The first is a 21-year-old man who complains of nasal congestion, sneezing, and itching with a primary trigger of cat exposure and mild improvement with some topical intranasal medications. In the video, you can see a, the right nasal cavity with the nasal septum to the right of, of the video. You can see a large polypoid mass, and as this mass is moved, it actually is attached to the middle turbinate itself. It's not emanating from the middle meatus as uh, we would expect from traditional paranasal sinus polyposis. On CT scan, in coronal view, moving anterior to posterior, we can see that the sinuses, in general, will be relatively undiseased. You can see opacification of the right nasal cavity, a large conchobulosa, and a left septal deviation. But the actual mucosal thickening within the paranasal sinuses is relatively minor. This particular patient underwent allergy skin testing. In our facility, the end point in the circled columns is highest at a level six. You can see lots of positive reactivity on the skin test, and the star there indicates uh, significant reactivity to cat allergen, which goes along with the patient's noted symptoms. So this particular patient has middle turbinate polyposis. In 2014, our group led by Dr. John Delgadio d discussed isolated middle terminate polyps or polypoid edema as being associated with a positive allergy test. This was further confirmed by the group in Sydney, Australia in 2016 that, where they independently identified that more severe polypoid changes such as diffuse edematous polypoid edema showed a stronger association with allergy. And then in 2017, the group in uh, New Orleans, led by Dr. Ed McCool, described the difference between isolated middle turbinate polyposis and traditional diffuse paranasal sinus polyposis. We can see Dr. McCool's work here. So the column uh, that is labeled PSP is paranasal sinus polyposis. This is traditional polyps stemming from the ethmoid cavity bilaterally and typically filling uh, multiple sinuses. The column labeled PCMT is polypoid changes of the middle turbinate. And that's consistent with what I've just described in this case. And you can see the differences between these two groups. So there's a clear difference in age with the, uh, the middle turbinate polyp group presenting younger. You can also see that the paranasal sinus polyposis group had a much higher prevalence of actual chronic rhinosinusitis, whereas the chronic rhinosinusitis in the middle turbinate polyp group was much lower. In contrast, the allergic rhinitis prevalence of the middle turbinate polyp group was much higher. I also want to highlight that the lund mackay score is significantly different between the two with the, the uh, middle turbinate polyp group being much lower, as we saw previously in the uh, case. So we'll look at a little bit more of an advanced case. This is a 77-year-old woman with nasal congestion for many years. Initially came to my clinic in 2009, having failed medical therapy and ultimately was advised to have sinus surgery. The surgery was delayed due to cardiac issues, and she represented 10 years later with similar symptoms. So we'll look at her CT scan, again, anterior to posterior. We'll initially see that there's some right-sided sinus disease, more prevalent than the left. As we progress more posteriorly in the scan, we can see that there's significant opacification of the central region of the nasal cavity with much less opacification of the surrounding sinuses, especially along the skull base and lamina papricia. So we're seeing a lot more disease centrally as compared to peripherally. At surgery, this is a video of the patient's left nasal cavity. 
So you can see here the septum on the left, the inferior turbinate on the right. And we'll initially see a very large edematous polypoid mass that's actually stemming from the nasal septum itself. This is not coming from the middle meatus. Posterior to that, you can see a little bit of the edge of the middle turbinate with some polypoid changes associated. And next we'll see this large polypoid septal mass being removed with through-cutting instruments. This makes us very happy as surgeons to be able to remove such a large polypoid mass and clear the nasal cavity. And then as we're cleaning that up along the septum, you can see the middle turbinate just behind that, again, with the polypoid changes anteriorly, and then also a relatively large polypoid mass coming from the middle turbinate itself and extending a bit more laterally. This particular patient was enrolled in a study that we are doing to evaluate uh, local nasal-specific IgE, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can see several positive uh, reactions on that testing. So this has been termed central compartment atopic disease, a name coined by my partner, John Delgadio. And this describes uh, polypoid changes of the middle and superior turbinate, as well as the nasal septum. It's highly associated with atopic status. And the CT changes are described as I showed on the last case. So central opacification with lateral and superior clearing. Of note, as the disease progresses, you can get more and more opacification of the sinuses spreading medial to laterally. And this is a pattern that's distinct from our traditional paranasal sinus polyposis. On pathology, we can see edematous polypoid changes. We can also see clusters of eosinophils. And that's shown a bit more here in this particular patient, highly eosinophilic process. So I'm going to discuss uh, just a bit about some of the preliminary work that we've done looking at uh, local nasal-specific IgE. There are a lot of talks in this session ad addressing local allergic rhinitis, so I'm happy to see that as well. Um, so middle terminate multifocal edema has been demonstrated to have a specificity of 94.7% for aeroallergen sensitivity. And we consider that given this relatively exuberant process that's happening in the nasal cavity with central compartment atopic disease, could this potentially represent a situation where local specific IgE would be identified? So in this uh, small pilot study, we examined three types of allergy testing. Traditional gold standards uh, allergy skin testing, serum specific IgE, and then specific IgE from the central compartment of the nasal cavity. And that was done by collection with a brush biopsy technique and then immunocap testing. And this is a, uh, a technique that has been described by Bill Reisacker at uh, Cornell University and previously published. So I'd like to, in the interest of time, just sort of highlight the, uh, oh, sorry, you can't see our, the pointer. Um, in the bottom chart, you can see that the median number of positive allergens was 10 for skin testing, six for serum-specific IgE, and 14 for the nasal-specific IgE. As has been previously noted, um, there is, uh, thank you so much. Um, there's a little, the, the standardization of nasal specific IgE is uh, not fully understood and so depending on where you set the cut point for that, some of these results may vary. Our particular cut point was set at 0.145. As we look at this chart, um, we can see the patients, patients at the top, 15 total patients, the various allergens down the side. So um, the skin test results are noted in the first uh, positive or negative. The serum specific IgE is next, and the central compartment specific IgE is next. The ones that are highlighted in green were completely concordant across all testing modalities. The ones that are in red were discordant. And then I want to just highlight the patients that had yellow results. 
And patients that had yellow results had negative systemic testing on both skin and uh, specific IgE, but positive local specific IgE. So this highlights that we can potentially pick up some allergen reactivity in the nasal cavity um, from our patients that have central compartment, even if their systemic testing is negative. We also evaluated the um, concordance and correlation between our various uh, testing modalities, and all of these showed significant correlation. You can see down here the sensitivity and specificity in our particular group with comparison to uh, skin testing as the gold standard. The central compartment specific IgE had a sensitivity of 73.2% and a specificity of 51%. The last couple of things I want to highlight is that there are some CT findings of central compartment atopic disease. I noted some of these previously, but uh, specifically septal involvement, relatively low Lund Mackay score, especially early in the disease process. And then if you get uh, significant um, disease centrally, you can potentially see the middle turbinates beginning to be oriented obliquely. As far as prevalence of allergy across different CRS with nasal polyp subtypes, we've noted that our central compartment patients have significant allergy, as I've mentioned before, on the order of allergic fungal sinusitis patients, and significantly more than CRS with nasal polyps NOS, or not otherwise specified. The asthma prevalence, however, is relatively low. And you can see here that, again, this group um, kind of follows the allergic fungal rhinosinusitis group with less asthma overall as compared to CRS with nasal polyps and uh, especially AERD. Finally, what are the outcomes of intervention in central compartment atopic disease? We looked at uh, four groups recently, CRS with nasal polyps not otherwise specified, AERD, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, and then finally CCAD. And we found that in these particular groups, the, um, we, we looked at polyp recurrence and then the need for revision surgery, and our um, CCAD, CCAD group had significantly lower polyp recurrence as well as need for surgery compared to the other groups. These are the numbers that go along with that um, uh, particular graph. So in summary, um, CCAD is a, appears to be a distinct subtype of sinonasal disease, and this has also been highlighted in the recent EPOS document um, under the type two classification of CRS. And I think that learning to recognize this entity will allow for appropriate management uh, and treatment of these patients. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this excellent presentation. I think Philippe Givert wants to question. Thank you, and um, I recognize this kind of entity. However, what I find difficult, certainly when I see your talk now, I was less confused before your talk than now. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that? Because I was thinking central compartment disease is when the uh, atmoid is not involved, and now you show nice CTs where it is involved. And then it's very hard for me to make the cut of what is the nasal polyps and what is the central compartment allergic disease. Um, is it then, well, you say, well, it's more uh, around the middle turbinate, but I think it's a very hard diagnostic cut off. I think we have to think about that how, how to do that because I wonder how you make your columns, how you put one in one group and one in the other group. Of course, if you say it's an allergic polyp and not everything is there, uh, so, so not uh, every sinus is involved, then it's a central compartment um, allergic disease. I'm not too happy with this kind of uh, where to put a patient in. So uh, I think as with all things polyps, sometimes patients are not distinctly categorized, right? There can be some crossover. So it's very nice when patients present as the first one did with, with just a, a nice little polyp and it's just in the nasal cavity and there's no sinus disease. But it all, some of it depends on the stage at presentation, right? So if they present 
a bit further on in their disease process, as I showed in the second one, there's clearly central disease, right? We saw the polyp attached to the septum. We see the polyps on, on the middle turbinates. As, the, as those turbinates lateralize and things become obstructed, we can potentially see the spread of opacification to the, the sinuses themselves just by virtue of obstruction. The other thing I think we have to realize is that sometimes peop, uh, patients present with multiple processes, right? So um, I have a patient that has AERD and AFS. Where do I classify that patient, right? Um, we, we can see in central compartment that sometimes the patients present not only with central compartment disease, but also paranasal sinus polyposis, polyps originating from the ethmoid cavity, clearly polyps in the, you know, in the ethmoid cells. And so it's not necessarily easy to categorize every patient into one specific category. I think the most important thing to remember here is that even if a patient presents with multiple processes or can be placed into multiple endotypes, if there are central compartment features, we should be thinking about an allergic contribution and asking the patient for their allergy history and considering allergy testing and immunotherapy. Okay, so thank you very much, Sarah, for this presentation. Uh, John, yeah. is this you? <laughs> yes, oh. it's me. <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm John Delgadio. Of course. Okay. Uh, Sarah's partner. Sarah, can you maybe just make a comment on, um, since this is an, an, uh, an inhalant allergy condition, what happens when you open up the sinuses in these patients? Sure. This is a common question. Um, so we have uh, learned, I think, by experience that the uh, surgical treatment for these patients, especially ones that present with relatively limited disease, the surgical treatment should probably also be relatively limited, right? So if they're presenting with polyps of the septum and the turbinates, we want to remove those polyps, sculpt the turbinates, um, and allow them to have improvement in their nasal obstruction, but probably not open the sinuses surgically with a complete fess. That can potentially allow allergen exposure to the sinus mucosa and can lead to increased edema and difficult to control disease. So, um, you know, it's important, number one, to have the patients always on um, topical steroids and and maintaining their chronic medical therapy, um, but also think about the degree of surgery that you're going to perform in these patients. Okay, again, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>